Our first speaker we're pleased to announce is Dr. Royal Skousen. He's a professor of linguistics and English language at Brigham University. Since 1988, he's been the editor of the Book of Mormon Critical Text Project. And so we're going to take about a minute here and get his PowerPoint up and ready to go, and then we'll turn the time over to him. What I'm going to be talking about today is uh, restoring the original text of the Book of Mormon. I've been working on the critical text project of the Book of Mormon since 1988, and there are a number of works that have been published. Uh, there are two main goals in this project. One is the attempt to restore the original English language text uh, to the extent that it can be done. Uh, this is the text that Joseph Smith, I believe, received uh, through the instrument and was able to read off. Uh, the second part of the project is to determine the history of the text, uh, the kinds of changes that it has undergone both accidental changes and changes that are consciously done mostly of an editorial uh, grammatical nature. When we are dealing with recovering the original text there are uh, two manuscripts that we are dealing with. Uh, the most important one is the original manuscript, the dictated manuscript that Joseph Smith dictated to his scribes, 28% uh, percent of this is extant. Uh, the other manuscript is called the Printer's Manuscript. This is a manuscript that was prepared to take to the 1830 printer to set the type. In the project, we also have studied thoroughly 20 printed editions of the Book of Mormon, uh, 15 LDS ones, uh, one private one from 1858, and four RLDS ones. I might point out the photographs that you will be seeing and which will be also <clears throat> viewed online um, do have copyright. Uh, as I indicated, 28% of the original manuscript is extant. Um, Joseph Smith in 1841 uh, placed the entire remaining part, part of the manuscript, missing the 116 pages that we know were lost in the cornerstone of the Nauvoo House in um, Nauvoo. And it lay there for the next 41 years until in 1882, Louis Bideman, the second husband of Emma, uh, after her death, retrieved uh, the manuscript. Most of it was severely damaged by water that had seeped in as well as mold that had eaten a lot of it away. Um, Bideman gave most of the larger pieces to LDS people, and so 25 of that 28% is in the archives of the LDS church. There's a half a leaf at the University of Utah, an equivalent of a leaf in fragments uh, from the Ada Cheney uh, fragments, and important for this project is the discovery of 2% of the text that Wilford Wood in 1937 bought from the son of Lewis Bideman, Charles Bideman. And um, let me just show you a little bit of those uh, fragments. Um, here we have the lump of fragments as they were observed on September the 30th, uh, 1991. And at the time we weren't sure if this really was the original manuscript or what it might be. It turned out to be mostly the original manuscript, about 2%. Here, Robert Espinoza, head of conservation at BYU's uh, library, is uh, beginning the very difficult task of teasing apart these fragments. Uh, this is one of the fragments from 2 Nephi uh, chapter 7, uh, rolled up, it is unraveled, here, and you can see on the edges the, uh, where the mold has eaten away uh, parts of the uh, uh, leaf, and also you can see the large water stain in the center uh, from water just laying on this uh, fragment. Uh, here, after uh, the fragment has been leveled, and photographed, you can see basically what it looks like. It's in the handwriting of Oliver Cowdery, uh, originally in 
black ink but turn brown over time. Uh, we found that uh, black and white ultraviolet photography brought out the text best of all. This particular fragment is very interesting because this is the original when Oliver copied it into the printer's manuscript for this particular portion he made six changes. Five of them are accidental. He's copying from Isaiah which is difficult in the first place. Uh, this is unusual for him. I think he was tiring at that time when he was making the copy, but he also made one change that was of a grammatical nature. Um, one of the big discoveries, I think, of the Critical Text Project was um, uh, the finding that for one-sixth of the Book of Mormon text, uh, the printer's manuscript was not the manuscript taken to the printer, but rather it was the original. And uh, we can see this with the pencil marks. You can see them quite well here in the color photograph from Helaman 15. Uh, these pencil marks are uh, placed there by the typesetter. About one third of the time he would mark up his manuscript in advance of uh, doing the typesetting. And so we find evidence of this in the original manuscript, but only from Helaman 13 uh, through the end of Mormon. Uh, here is the black and white ultraviolet, which doesn't show the pencil marks very well. Um, the reason this is important for the text, it means that for Helaman 13, basically, to the end of Mormon, there are two first-hand copies of the original manuscript. We have very little of the original manuscript remaining here, just a small percentage. But we have two first-hand copies, which be basically means that if they agree, uh, the printer's manuscript and the 1830 edition, then that's probably what the original read. If they disagree, one of the readings is probably the correct one. But that becomes a difficult problem sometimes, trying to determine which one might be the correct reading. Uh, here's what the printer's manuscript looks like. This is the first leaf. Uh, the bottom portion of this has been worn away, the bottom one and a half lines. This is in the hand of Oliver Cowdery. Uh, here is a blown up version of it. And you will note here there are a number of corrections. Uh, on the third line, uh, the um, 2B is crossed out and above written is. This is a grammatical correction that Joseph Smith made uh, when he edited the printer's manuscript for the second edition of the Book of Mormon. Uh, on the next line, you can barely see it. Um, there's a small P in, uh, that the typesetter added. It's above the line, it's, stand, it's in pencil, and it means put a new paragraph here. Uh, there are a cu couple of other corrections here where Oliver, who was the original scribe, missed or did something wrong originally and he corrects himself. He inserts some words above the line and on the very bottom he originally wrote the word that and he crossed it out and wrote the above. So you get this kind of interplay in uh, the printer's manuscript and you get things like that in the original. This is what's called a facsimile transcript. In uh, doing the critical text of the Book of Mormon, we produce these transcripts which faithfully reproduce what's actually on the paper. Uh, you will note, by the way, that the word prophet in, or prophets in the next to the last line is not spelled correctly and destroyed in the last line is not spelled correctly. Uh, we leave it to you to figure out what it should be and most of the time there isn't a problem. Um, in 2001, uh, Farms published the uh, facsimile transcripts of the original and the printer's manuscript. Uh, these are the, two, the three large blue books which I have up here, and they reproduce all the uh, known portions of the original as well as the basically complete printer's manuscript so you can read what's on the actual a manuscript. Um, continuing from that, uh, there are three other volumes. Volume four is uh, last year was completed. 
This is the analysis of textual variants. These are six books, uh, the maroon books, which are up here. And they represent um, my work going through the text, basically verse by verse, looking at all the variants, potential variants, looking at the evidence to try and determine what the original reading might have been. Uh, volume three is a history of the text, which I am currently working on, and volume five will be a computerized collation uh, that will be made available with volume three. I'll show you a little bit more of that in a second. Um, one of the things, though, that I discovered as I was completing or getting near the end of volume four, the six maroon books, uh, were some potential problems. One of the problems was that I was having difficulty in getting people that were even doing research on Book of Mormon work to cite uh, the findings of the Critical Text Project. Uh, there are these lovely six books, heavy, and I know they're heavy, I dry, drug them in here. Um, they're also expensive, and uh, generally people were not they were writing articles very often oblivious to what the reading was uh, or should be, or at least what I thought it should be. And um, the other problem, though, that I noted was that with the completion of Volume 4, anyone could go out and produce a Book of Mormon, uh, taking the findings of Volume 4 and producing it, referring to it as the original text and I decided that I would prefer to do this myself. And so therefore I arranged uh, with Yale University Press uh, to publish uh, last year, about a year ago, the Book of Mormon, the earliest text. And uh, this basically in one volume represents the original text to the extent that it can be determined. If you take off the cover, of this book, you will see that it matches the maroon of the, volume four. And that was done intentionally to show the connection that it does derive from what's in volume four. Um, there are two important innovations, I believe, in uh, the Yale edition. The first is that it is set in sense lines. Uh, not in paragraphs, not in the small little paragraph verses that we are familiar with, and not in double columns. Um, what I tried to do originally, my idea was to break the lines in a kind of fashion that would represent Joseph Smith's dictation of the text by phrases and clauses, so that none of them would be too long and could be readily read. Um, and we'll look at some pages of the text here in a moment. But one of the things which I discovered or discovered since that readers have particularly liked is readers can see things that they have never seen before because it is set in the sense lines. And also readers do not get fatigued as readily in reading a text that the, 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 the two column text which breaks in the middle of words, in the middle of phrases, uh, puts a lot of stress, I think, on the reader to just simply negotiate the text. And um, with, the, with the sense lines, it is much easier just to keep reading. And many readers have suddenly discovered they've read several chapters at a time instead of just their one chapter that they would expect. Uh, the second aspect of this text is that it is an attempt to recover the original English language text. Uh, this, is, this text does not have what we call a copy text. It does not take an edition of the Book of Mormon and revise it. If everything has been done from scratch and from the computerized collation, as we will see. Uh, here is the title page of the Yale edition, and here you see the title page of the Book of Mormon. And the breaks are at places where one could pause reasonably, especially if you were reading the text off to someone for dictation purposes. Um, you'll note, by the way, translated by Joseph Smith is not on the title page, because it wasn't on the title page of the Book of Mormon. 
Instead, it's on the previous page, what we call the half title, which is the appropriate place to place it. Here's the beginning of First Nephi. You'll notice it just says the book of Nephi because the manuscripts tell us that that is the way it was called. There are four of them in the Book of Mormon, the book of Nephi. And Oliver Cowdery added first, second, third, and fourth, and or later editors have. And um, so this is the way the text originally uh, read. Uh, and so we reproduce it that way. Uh, this is the next page. You can see the sense lines. Uh, there are also extra lines that stand for paragraphs where we, I've broken the text into manageable portions. This is a clear text, a plain text. There's no editorial intrusion of much except for the sense lines and the paragraph breaks. I put the LDS chapter and verse numbers out in the margin because you do need to reference the book. Um, and here I just show another page where there's a transition in going from the end of Mosiah to Alma. Uh, I want to go a little bit over how this text was constructed as I said, it doesn't have a copy text. This is the computerized collation for a portion of 1 Nephi going from chapter 3 to chapter 4. It's an instructive portion, I think, for several reasons. Uh, you will notice on this that at the beginning of each variant, a line, there will be something in curly brackets. This stands for the kind of variant that will follow. Then there will be something in square brackets, and this will give the actual variant. The very first one up there is a number, and it's a verse number, and it shows that uh, 0 and 1 are the two manuscripts, and they don't have any chapters or verses. And then you have A through T, which are the editions of the Book of Mormon. And you can go down through it in this way. The underlying text represents what I believe to be the original text with spelling regularized. Uh, the bold stands for the reading of the original manuscript. And in other portions, you won't see any bolding simply because the original isn't extant. From this, I extracted with a computer the text that was underlined so that I did not key in the text for the Yale edition. And this is what you get for that portion. And this is much like what the typesetter would have been confronted with. A just long string of words and uh, no real beginnings except at the beginning of original chapter breaks. And so from that, then I constructed the sense lines and put extra lines in for where I thought there were breaks in the for paragraphs or narration. That's an addition that's being added to help the reader. Uh, then I added the LDS chapter and verse numbers. And one of the things you'll notice right here that chapter four comes in the middle of a paragraph break. And if you read this portion, you'll see that that actually is appropriate that there shouldn't be a chapter break there, and Orson Pratt put one there for the uh, chapter break. Um, so those are added, and then finally we put in some kind of punctuation and capitalization from scratch. I found this to be the most difficult portion, and I'm frankly amazed at John Gilbert, the 1830 typesetter's ability. He did most of it by about two-thirds the time as he was setting the type. I don't know how he did it. He did a really fine job, probably over-punctuated. But what I wanted to do was to do it from scratch. And as far as I know, this is the only other time that it's been done in total from scratch, or at least published. Um, in addition, in the, Yale in the Yale edition, there are is an appendix that lists significant changes in the text. There are 719 of these, and they're at the end of the book. This is not a comparison between the current standard text and the Yale edition. 
Instead, it's a representation of important changes that have occurred in the history of the text. In many instances, the Yale edition agrees with the standard text, so it's not really intended to be uh, a listing of differences. One of the things we get in the back is what's called a, st a stemma, which shows the relationship between the editions of the Book of Mormon. You will notice here there are two textual traditions that split off from the 1837, the second edition. One is the RLDS one uh, that's on the uh, left, and on the right is the LDS one. And these relationships show what's called the copy text. If you look at the 1920 edition there, its copy text is a 1911 edition of the Book of Mormon. And so the typesetter is working off a 1911, and we're showing here the copy text relationships. Uh, then we have going through, this is the beginning of the 719, you can't read them very well here, uh, but I indicate with a pointer which one I have accepted. We will also list um, always the original reading, if it exists, the printers, the 1830. And then we'll list any other edition that deviates from its copy text, where they decide on some other reading. And so you can actually reconstruct the whole history of each of these if you have the stemma uh, from it. Um, these are placed, though, at the end, not in the middle of the text. I wanted nothing to intrude upon the text itself when you read it. And here's a second page, I believe. Um, when we look at uh, the Yale edition, and uh, particularly volume four of the critical text, uh, there are over 5,000 cases of variation that I considered. And it turns out that there are about, over, there are about 2,000 or so of these, a little more, that the Yale edition accepts, which would differ from the current uh, standard text. Um, that in and itself is not particularly an important number because most of these changes aren't uh, earth-shaking. However, there's one, there are a couple numbers that I think are important. One is there are over 600 changes uh, in the Yale edition which have never appeared in any printed edition, standard printed edition of the Book of Mormon, LDS or uh, RLDS. Uh, and if you look at those numbers there, you will see they're coming from the manuscripts. The majority are coming from the original manuscript. And there are a good number actually from the printers that have never been implemented in any of the editions. You may also note at the bottom, um, 113 conjectures. We'll come back to conjectures. Uh, I want to point out, though, the significance of the original uh, manuscript. Uh, in the six books that we have over here, um, I went through those 606 unique readings, or new readings, and I assigned them uh, to, um, or I took out the conjectures, but I assigned them according to um, where they place in the books. And with asterisks, we have the, the three sections we have an asterisk, we have large portions of the original. And look at the number of changes that show up. Uh, for the first and the fourth one, we have about 75% of the original. So we get almost 100 changes in both of them. For the fifth one, we only have about 25% of the original and we're getting a proportionate amount. For the other three sections, we have hardly anything of the original, and it shows. And what this really means is that by human means, we aren't going to be able to recover the original text, literally in some sense, because we don't have the original. I think it's a sober thought. We need to keep it in mind. A second factor which I think is quite important in looking at the Yale edition is there are 241 readings that make a difference in meaning. Now by difference in meaning, I mean that if we translate the text into another language, there will be a change in the words, that some word difference is there. It makes a difference in translation, not in necessarily phraseology. 
So 1 Nephi 12 and 18 is a good example of this. Um, and a great and terrible gulf divideth them, yea, even the sword of the justice of the eternal God. This is the way the original manuscript reads. Uh, Oliver cop miscopied it as the word of the justice of the eternal God. And that's the reading that's been retained in the text. When we look at the rest of the text, we discover that there are all these references to the sword of God's justice, but there are no examples of the word of God's justice. And particularly notice the one in Ether 8, which is very much identical. Uh, but this is one where when we translate it, sword, I don't know of any language where sword and word is the same word. They're all going to end up involving a change. This is what I mean by a change in meaning. It doesn't date make a huge change in terms, you can deal with God's justice being his word, uh, but that isn't what the text read. It did read sword. Uh, some people ask, does it ever change doctrine? And the answer is no. If it does make a change dealing with doctrine, it restores the correct doctrine. An example of this is in Alma 39, uh, where Alma, talking to his son, uh, tells the, him to go back and, to the Zoramites and acknowledge your faults and repair that wrong which you have done. When Oliver copied this, after he got done writing the page in the original, he dropped ink drops on the page. And the P has an ascender, and a little drop of ink went right on top of it and crossed it. So it looks like a T. And Oliver's R's and N's are sometimes look alike. So when he came to copy this, he copied it as acknowledge your faults and retain that wrong which you have done. And it really doesn't quite work. And the 1920 committee decided to just remove it because it didn't make any sense. And they ended up saying that he should go back and acknowledge your faults and that wrong which you have done. Go back and say you're sorry. But it took out the reparation. And when we look at other parts of the Book of Mormon, we indeed find that when people confess their sins, they do everything they can to repair the wrongs or the injuries that they've done. Here's one in Mosiah. Here's one in Helaman 5. So what we find is the doctrine is restored. It doesn't change it. Uh, there are 15 new readings for Book of Mormon names. I think the most interesting one I'll mention is Mulek, being spelled M-U-L-O-C-H. This is for the son of King Zedekiah. The implication being that he named his son after the god that they sacrificed children to, a rather ominous aspect of uh, King Zedekiah. Um, I pointed out that the Yale edition has 113 conjectural emendations that have not been printed before, and some people have been critical of this. But I think it's worth noting that conjectural emendations occur very often in the, all of the printed editions. A conjecture is whenever a typesetter, a scribe, or an editor doesn't like the reading of the copy text, and doesn't like any other readings that might have appeared and decides on another reading. That's a conjecture. And what we find is that they're quite common and they have to be there. Sometimes the original manuscript has such a bad reading that no one is going to accept it. I don't think. First Nephi 7 and 5, and the Lord did soften the heart of Ishmael, and also his whole whole. That's the way the original manuscript reads, whole whole. It's a correction, but it, that's what the scribe decided on. When Oliver came to copy this, he wasn't going to accept it. And he decided it was household. So he has, and also his household. My belief is that the original text stood for his, and also his whole household and this is where you're getting the two holes. As support for this, we find that if we look at the rest of the text of the Book of Mormon, when they refer to a patriarch and his household, it is always the entire household, including the example in Alma 22. 
his whole household. Um, but in any event, the point is, I don't think you can accept the reading of the original manuscript. There will be a conjecture. Every text of the Book of Mormon is going to conjecture that reasonably. Uh, when we look at the standard text following this procedure, we find there are 600 or so conjectural readings. There are about 350 or so in the Yale edition. So the Yale edition accepts a lot of difficult readings that people have removed over time. Uh, in all, in volume four, I considered about 1,300 and so conjectural emendations, suggested ones, and so forth. About one-fourth are accepted. Um, it's also worth noting that when we compare the Yale edition with the 1981 that there are 187 conjectures that we agree on. So there is concern and wrote it as land with a D. Uh, when we look at every other place in the Book of Mormon, four places in 3 Nephi 13, it is only the gospel of the Lamb, not, it's never the gospel of the Lord. It's possible, but that isn't the way the Book of Mormon does it. Uh, John Gilbert, who's the compositor or typesetter for the 1830 edition, made 167 conjectures. Um, a large amount of these are accepted, 47 percent. Um, the reason they're basically accepted is he had a lousy reading in front of him. It, something had to be done, and he pretty well guessed right. Um, that's why his percentage is pretty high. Uh, I give an, uh, here's an example, though, that I don't think he was right on, and ye, shall, and ye shall not be put down and cast into the fire. And he didn't like put, and so he changed it to hewn down. And that's the common way the Book of Mormon refers to being hewn down and cast into the fire. But I think what the original read here, which we don't have, was cut down and, the ca and probably written with a capital C. And so it, he misread it, the scribe uh, misread it as a P, and thus we got put. Um, Joseph Smith made a large number of conjectures for the second edition, a few for the third edition. Um, Joseph Smith very often was trying to remove difficult readings. He just felt this is difficult to deal with, let's do this. And so you'll see that his percentage is rather low because he is trying to remove difficult readings. Um, there's one here where he inserted a knot that I think is correct. Another one where he changed King Benjamin to King Mosiah. I think that's incorrect. And you can read the arguments in volume four. Here are some other significant additions. I'll just point out the one that's really high is 1920 with James Talmage. Again, uh, having trouble with difficult readings and removing them. And the majority of, you know, only about one out of six are uh, really, I think, correct. Um, here are some LDS scriptural scholars that independently have made suggestions prior to the critical text project, and they are pretty good suggestions and a rather high percentage of acceptance. Uh, myself, I've tried to deal with about 400, accepting about 100 or so, about one out of four. Uh, but as what has really been helpful for this project are people who have independently been sending me suggestions or even statements, I think something's wrong here, this doesn't make sense. And uh, 42 individuals have done this uh, with 173 suggested changes and about one out of five actually being accepted. So there's a tremendous amount of input, I think, in the Yale edition from sort of lay readers. Uh, the, I've listed eight people here who basically seem to have gone through the whole text uh, on their own just looking for readings that they felt uh, might be worthy of looking at. Uh, the final thing that I want to talk about here is the evidence that this text um, is something extraordinary. Uh, the evidence that I have been finding as I've been doing my work is that I believe the text was given to Joseph Smith through the instrument that he was using word for word. I believe he could actually see the words 
in English. And he read them off. B.H. Roberts thought it was too easy. Well, B.H. Roberts never did it. In any event, uh, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that text was controlled down to the very word, in fact, to the very letter, at least for the names. Um, the first bit of evidence has to do with Hebrew-like constructions. One of the ones I've been studying quite a bit is the extra use of an and that follows a subordinate clause, and it comes before the main clause. But what I've discovered recently is it doesn't happen if the subordinate clause is simple. It only happens if there's some complexity, an extra phrase or clause, and sometimes interruptive. And when that happens, the and usually appears. And here's a couple of examples with the conjunction as and because, and they'll be out there online. They're also in the preface to the Yale edition. Here's one with when and after. The next one is probably one of the most famous passages in the Book of Mormon. And if ye shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, and he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. Uh, all of these extra ands have been removed from the text because they're such bad English. But what does it say about the translation? It says that Joseph Smith, I think, had to have seen and. If he were just getting ideas, there's no reason to put these ands in. They're non-English. They haven't occurred in any dialects that I've been able to find, in the history of the language, and so forth. Um, and it isn't just an accident that the scribe, you know, there's so many ands, just put another one in. We have this wonderful example from Helaman 12 where there are seven of them virtually in a row. Um, and so, in my mind, this is an indication that there really is some, he is seeing the word and. He isn't making it up as part of his translation. Another one, a uh, rather controversial one, is that the vocabulary in the Book of Mormon, the meanings of the words come from the 15 and 1600s. And there are examples that can be found in the King James Bible. To cast an arrow, meaning to shoot an arrow can be found in the King James Bible. Or another example, to require, meaning to request. Thy fathers have also required of me this thing. Uh, where, um, so you have this meaning which requested is probably more appropriate. Or to wrap, meaning to roll up and the earth shall be wrapped together as a scroll. And these are meanings, the OED stands for the Oxford English Dictionary, and these are meanings that typically are dying out in the 1600s. But they are in the Book of Mormon. But they're in the Bible. And so people that believe that Joseph Smith, the translator, has got his Bible down, really, you know, this is, this is evidence. He really does have it down well. Well, there are examples, though, in the original text of the Book of Mormon that are not in the King James Bible, but they are in early modern English. But if, meaning unless, this example from Mosiah 3 was changed by the 1920 editors because it didn't make, they knew it made, un, it, made it, it means unless, so they put the word unless in. Uh, another example, to commend, used in a sentence, meaning to recommend, and now I would commend you to seek this Jesus, means recommend for us today. And OED usage will have it uh, as dying out. Uh, a very interesting one is to counsel someone. And this means to counsel with someone. And there are two examples of this in the original text. The 1920 committee added the with. It's correct as far as meaning goes. But if you go back to the 15, 1600s, you have uses like this. Uh, to depart, this is one of the most interesting ones. Uh, depart was used regularly in Bibles uh, up to the King James Bible. But depart was in, in the sense of the meaning to part or to separate. Uh, but the King James translators, by then it was getting archaic and they removed every one of them. So they're not in the King James. But the Book of Mormon has this particularly, or in, in the example of Helaman 8 and 11, 
talking about the waters of the Red Sea and they departed hither and thither and the typesetter this time just, just didn't believe it was right and just put parted. Uh, but we have examples like the Geneva Bible, they departed my raiment among them. This is the way, but the King James Bible has, they parted. Um, some other examples that help us understand, I think, the text better, they don't have to be this way, but if we're in this 15, 1600 vocabulary, uh, detect may mean expose, to make public, to detect someone, uh, and now behold, we will detect this man and he shall confess his fault. We will expose him. Extinct meaning dead with respect to individuals, not species. This use was common in English up to the late 1600s and it's in the Book of Mormon where they talk about killing someone and making them extinct. Um, this is an interesting one where the text says to hurl, uh, Satan referring to hurling away your souls down to hell, basically. And we could think of it as throwing, but in early modern English, this has the meaning to drag with violence. And this is actually the expression we expect, that Satan will drag us down to hell. Uh, to pitch battle as an actual syntactic we, uh, usage, we only have it in the set phrase, I think, you know, they fought a pitched battle and we seem to think of it as a full-fledged battle. It means a fully set battle. Uh, but the Book of Mormon has actual syntactic use of it as it was in um, early modern English. Rebellion. We think of the word rebellion as rebelling against higher authority. And, but there's one in the Book of Mormon where rebellion is used to mean it's the, the Lamanite king is stirring up his people in rebellion against the people of King Limhi. And this, doesn't, this makes King Limhi's people above them, and they're not. But in early modern English, I've only got a quite early one here, probably more research needs to be done on all these, but the word rebellion could just mean in opposition. A third uh, aspect of the consistency of the language, there are over a hundred of these that I've discovered that when you go through the original text, you remove exceptions, little wrinkles to expressions. And the Book of Mormon is so consistent in these, it doesn't look like it's some translator thinking, oh, what shall I do this time? Um, there's a very controlling of the text. For instance, whatsoever, always occurs, never whatever. Conditions, conditions of repentance, it's always in the plural in the original text. Uh, this time to refer to the present, never these times, but plural is used for past times and future times, but present is always singular. Not in the current text. To observe, to keep the commandments, never to observe the commandments. Thus ended a period of time, not thus end at the period of time. That occurs now four times in our current text, but it isn't in the original. To do iniquity, always in the singular. If it so be that, it's the, that's the word order in the original. To have hope, never to have hoped. And the Nephites and the Lamanites, always Nephites, come first, but not in the current text. There's a wrinkle. So the Yale edition restores this and over a hundred of these. Uh, where the original is very systematic. There are also identical citations. This is a well-known one where in 1 Nephi, compared with Alma 36, the wording is precisely the same. If Joseph Smith is getting ideas, whatever the process is, it's being made sure that he gets the words down exactly right. Uh, this is that one that uh, is of interest textually. It's a liturgical statement. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and of earth, the creator of all things from the beginning. It's very liturgical sounding, but in the original text, the first one has an of before earth, but it was dropped by the 1830 printer by accident. So now in the text, it's not identical, but it was originally. And finally, there's letter for letter control. I've talked about this quite a bit. Uh, the people witnessing the translation always said, or they said that Joseph Smith 
would, when the scribe needed it, would spell out the difficult Book of Mormon names. And we find clear evidence of this in the manuscript, the original. I particularly like the last one, Coriantumr. Well, I can talk. <laughs> oh, here we go. Maybe it'll come back. Well, Coriantumr. Maybe that's, that's your clue. I'm supposed to stop. <laughs> It's okay. Let me just close. You can study, I've written about these names where they show that Joseph Smith had to have spelled out the names. Um, what I, uh, well, let's just do the last one. This is what I've been trying to do in the Yale edition, uh, provide an inviting format for the text uh, for both LDS and non-LDS readers to make the most accurate text possible and to have significant textual variants, but listed at the back. And um, I just want to say that when you look at this text and it's word for word transmission, I believe, I, it's very clear to me that it was a revealed text to Joseph Smith and that however it was done, he received it that way word for word. And um, when it's been said that it's a marvelous work and a wonder. It's my belief that indeed it is precisely that. Thank you. Okay, Amalekites. That's a mistake that Oliver Cowdery made in from Alma 21 on. They're all Amalekites. And the original manuscript is very close to Amalekites, not Amalekites. Um, someone's asking about There are two groups, basically, in the text. In Alma 2, you have the Amalekites. And then all of a sudden, in Alma 21, you have this other group, Amalekites. It's just an error. There's only one apostate group. Um, Oh, word prints. That's really a complicated issue. That's a whole talk. I'm, I'll, I'll, whoever wants to talk about that, we can later. Um, when it says in the Article of Faith that the Book of Mormon, we believe in it as far as, well, we believe in the Bible as far as it is translated correctly. And then we just said the Book of Mormon. Um, it was, the Book of Mormon was translated in the sense of transmitted. And that's, I think, how Joseph Smith really uses the word. It's being transmitted through him. This sense that the, that the scriptures are being translated like we understand it, I think, is a mistake. And so this is, Joseph Smith is not saying we believe in the Bible as far as it's been translated correctly, because then why aren't we reading the Hebrew and the Greek then? Is he saying the Hebrew and the Greek is correct? No, they're full of errors or at least a lot of places to debate. And so I think he's saying that we believe in the Bible as far as it's been transmitted correctly. And he knows that he got it correctly when it was transmitted to him, the Book of Mormon. Um, yeah, there will probably be an online edition of the critical text, but I hold him back. Um, well, as this question asks about Joseph Smith's edits, uh, his grammatical editing is pretty much uh, removed uh, because it's an add-on on his part. And the conjectural ones where he tried to deal with easier readings, uh, as I indicated, um, what was it, about one out of six might have been accepted. Um, Joseph Smith put the original manuscript, I believe, in the cornerstone because he thought he was going to protect it. A bad mistake, but I, I think that was his intent. Ebenezer Robinson said he went into his house, he got out the manuscript, and he made everybody wait out there while he went through it, every page, to make sure it was all there. And that's what I think his intent was, to preserve it. It was a mistake. Don't put anything valuable in any cornerstone. <laughs> I say that, temple or otherwise, put copies. 
that's the same question. Um, will the church incorporate these changes into future editions? Maybe a hundred years from now. I don't think currently there may be a handful. Um, that's my understanding, but I don't know myself. Um, there is no panel. So, you know, I don't have a committee that's voting like on the New Testament one. So it's Royal Skousen and his thinking on it. And you can read the arguments and you can write against them. And um, so it is coming through me. Uh, so I use the passive, I'm sorry about that. But I could have used the royal we. <laughs> Uh, I did not put the changes in, highlighted in the text. I want that Yale edition just to read. You will find you won't notice much anything in that Yale edition of all these things that I've mentioned because they make sense. The only thing you're going to notice is the non-standard grammar. They will grab you. They was is going to grab most of us here. But not my former bishop on Geneva Road. Well, another question about the 15 and 1600 language. What does it mean? And right now, I've decided not to speculate on what it means. I think it's something I'm studying. Uh, I thought for a while, had ought to, might be just an Americanism, but uh, I'm discovering examples of it back to Caxton in the late 1400s. So even expressions which sometimes people say are Americanisms may be older. And another thing we're studying is the bad grammar. Um, uh, this bad grammar may not just be upstate New York, but many of them, uh, in fact, virtually all of them can be found earlier in English. And what that represents, I'm not sure. Uh, some of the bad grammar may be due to overlay on the part of Joseph Smith or the scribe. There's usually, Oliver always writes drowned, but one scribe writes drowned. We put drowned it in, so there's variation in the Yale edition on that. But that drowned it could be, it's probably one of the Whitmers, and that may be his own contribution. But we just have to go with drowned. Um, so we might have some grammatical overlay. It's one of the remaining issues that I will be discussing in volume three. Thank you very, very much.